Now, one of the things I'd like to talk about now is the subject of creative confidence. And this is, doesn't only relate to my own life and your life as an artist, but it relates to um, a talk that I saw on TED.com by a man named David Kelly. In this talk, he talks about, like I said, creative confidence, and furthermore, how that confidence can be severely hampered throughout the course of your life, and that those obstacles can actually start presenting themselves at a very young age. An experience that I had in my youth was where we, my French teacher, who was also appointed as the art teacher, unfortunately, um, gave us an assignment in art class to do our own personal project that was to be presented at the school board a few weeks later. So my idea was to create a sculpture out of blue clay of this kind of muscle man, he-man type of character, where I, and then I, for a head I had a big plate that I painted yellow, and then I painted the eyes in, in black and red. And that was my idea. And right in front of the class, the teacher looked at my piece, she pulled the plate off of the sculpture, ripped it in half, threw it in the garbage, and said, that's not how you do it. That doesn't look good. And then proceeded to grab another plate and paint her own face and stick it on. Now, I was really upset about that, especially the fact that my teacher just ripped up my artwork. And I went home and I told my mother about it. Now, my mom, being a an art teacher herself, was furious and called the school with this livid complaint, saying, you never do that. And of course, the school apologized and said I could do it again. And the next, the next art class, I redid the face. And then two weeks later, when we went to go and check out the work at the school board, lo and behold, my teacher had ripped up that one as well and replaced it yet again. So of course, you know, you know, she was a horrible teacher. There's no doubt about it, especially when it came to art. But, uh, but the, the, the important thing to take out of this is the fact that I was lucky. My mother was an art teacher. My mother could defend this quote unquote injustice to my art. She understood how, how ne what a negative impact doing something like this would do on a creative mind, especially a young creative mind. My mother understood the fact that from an artistic perspective, creative um, exploration is purely the exploration of your own mind. It's the creation, it's the exploration of self, of yourself. And everybody's got their own interpretation of things. It is a sacrilege for a teacher to ever paint on top of your artwork, unless, of course, it's a professional who is doing so to give you an example of how you approached it and how you could approach it differently. When you're later on, when you're already a professional and you know what you're doing, then having an, a professional artist paint over your work is can be a great benefit. It's actually a very good tool to teach. But when you're young and you're exploring yourself, or you're working on your own stuff and you're exploring your own mind, that kind of thing can play a very negative, can very have a very negative impact on your growth artistically. I had a mother to defend me. But what about all those kids who did not have an artist parent to defend them and teach them the valuable lesson that art teachers never touch their students' artwork? That child might very well grow up with that bad seed of influence in their mind. And how many people have you ever known, have you ever encountered that said, I'm not really the creative type? That's actually not true. Everybody is the creative type. But not everybody has the confidence to express themselves creatively through whatever influence. But if you look at any child, there isn't a single child on earth up to a certain age that isn't completely free to do whatever they want. If you gave 35 students, if you, if you went into a class of eight-year-olds and said, I want you to do, draw a bear in a forest, you would get 35 completely different interpretations of that bear in the forest, regardless of whether or not these kids actually had technical skill or not, because you, can only, you can't really have much technical skill at, at eight years old, you have that creative freedom. But somewhere down the line, you lose it. Even as an artist, you could have lost it. And one of the most important lessons you can learn artistically when it comes to exploring your mind and your ideas creatively is the ability to just let go. Stop questioning yourself. Just try out some crazy stuff. It doesn't matter if you think it's silly. The only reason you're saying it's silly is because somewhere in there you're thinking to yourself, my audience won't appreciate it. It's not a good enough idea. Okay. A very good example that illustrates what I'm talking about is um, a quote by John Rhys Davies. John Rhys Davies, John Rhys Davies is uh, the actor who played Gimli in Lord of the Rings. And one of my favorite things to watch is the making of Lord of the Rings. And in one of them, he's talking about the scene where he's having a, a drinking competition with Legolas, and he, at that scene, uh, in that scene, um, uh, John Rhys Davies approached it entirely 
um, as improv. Improv meaning he was improvising. He was making it up as he went along. And he, he said, and I quote, 90% of improv is garbage. Most of it is garbage. However, every now and then you pick something out of that that works. Sometimes you screw up, sometimes you do something that works, sometimes a little bit of both. But it's the exploration of something unknown. It's the, the, the ability to just let yourself go and try out whatever silly thing that comes to mind. Jim Carrey is one of the best improv actors out there because he just has the freedom to let go and do whatever comes to mind at first. As an artist, you have to explore that same thing. Just put whatever garbage on a piece of paper that you can think of, whatever pops into mind, and you will be able to, to cultivate that into something well thought out and even brilliant in time. But ideas, in essence, start off as something stupid that you grow on, that you build on until it becomes something concrete and meaningful. So question how much confidence you have creatively on your own terms and how many times you question whether or not you have a good idea. Now, at this point of the painting, two things needed to be worked on. I actually had two days to step away from my own work, which is what I generally do with all of my work when I reach a point where I'm not sure where to take it. And over the couple of days while I was working on other contracts, I um, realized that there were two things that I wanted to push. One was contrast, and the other one was color. I found the contrast was a little bit too bland, and I needed to push that focal point where the girl's wa walking through the archway. And the second thing was color. It was a little bit too complimentary and I needed to break apart light and color and uh, bring in a little bit more energy and life to the painting altogether. So a better way to kill two birds with one stone than to play with the properties of light. Now what you're probably familiar with at this point, and do be aware of the fact that I'm going to be going quick with this information, it's because there's a lot to cover and I have to keep it relatively short. It's a video, so you can pause and rewind at your own personal leisure. Now what you're probably familiar with at this point is pigment colors. Pigments meaning paints, inks, pencil, crayons, gouache, oil, acrylic, whatever the case might be. Anything you paint or draw with. And the pigment primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. If we mix any two of these together, we get our secondaries, orange, green, and purple. And if we mix everything together, we get black. So essentially, the more we mix pigments together, the more we lower the value, the darker we make that color. Okay, So the only way to raise the value is to add higher value or white paint to that color to make it a higher value. Or if we want to make it darker, we have to add black or lower value paint in order to lower the value. So essentially, because the more we mix pigments together, the more we are subtracting value, the more we're making it darker, pigments have a subtractive quality to them. Okay, Subtractive meaning the more we mix, the more we subtract value, the darker we make them. However, we're going to be looking at light and how light works. And that's how, where my brain is going to be in terms of how we're going to be approaching the rest of this painting. And if we look at our primary colors of light, they're slightly different than those of pigments. We ha instead of having red, yellow, blue, we have red, green, and blue. However, the big difference is when we start to mix the colors of light together. If we mix red and green, we get yellow. Green and blue gives us cyan, and blue and red gives us magenta. And furthermore, if we mix them all together, we get white. What's happening? Well, the more we mix light, the brighter it gets, the more we are raising the value. That is why light is referred to as having additive properties as opposed to pigments that have subtractive properties. The more we add, the brighter it gets, the more we are adding value. Okay. Photoshop actually has a way of mimicking the additive and subtractive properties of light. Now, if I hit tab to show or hide my interface, I'm going to show it now. On a different layer, I'm going to apply the three different primary colors of light. So on one layer, I have red, then I'm going to do green on another layer. And then on a third layer, I'm going to put blue. Now, in order to tell Photoshop that I want Photoshop to read and mix colors using the additive properties of light, basically mimicking, mimicking the qualities of light, I have to set my blend mode here on my layers to linear dodge add. I'm going to do the same thing for all three, linear dodge add, linear dodge add. Now if we refer back to our color wheel here, we'll see that if I mix red and green together, we get yellow. Red and green gives me yellow. If I mix red and blue, it gives me magenta. 
If I mix green and blue, it gives me cyan. Furthermore, if I mix all three together, what do I get? Any guesses? Any guesses? White. That's correct. So it's actually adding value as we mix these together, the same way light does. Now, Photoshop also has a way of mimicking the subtractive qualities of light. And if we look here, imagine these three being transparent sheets of plastic, the type of plastic you put over a spotlight to change the color of, of that spotlight. Well, if we look here and imagine these being three transparent cells of plastic, we have our secondary colors here, yellow, magenta, and cyan. Yellow, magenta, cyan. And look what happens if we mix two of these together. If I mix yellow and magenta, that actually reverts us back to our primary color of light, red. Right? Yellow and magenta gives us red. Yellow and cyan gives us green, our second primary. And magenta and cyan gives us blue, our third primary. Furthermore, if we mix all three of these cells together, together it gives us black. But if we put this in the context of light, black is transparency. It's, there's no such thing as black light. Okay, if we have black light, we have no light, so to speak. Okay, so in this particular case, it has subtractive qualities. The more we mix together, the more we are subtracting value. And in Photoshop, it doesn't, the, the technical term for transparency in Photoshop is known as alpha. So if you ever hear the term alpha used in context to a digital painting program, they're referring to the transparency. Zero alpha means completely transparent. 100%, no, sorry, zero alpha means something's completely visible. 100% alpha means it's completely invisible. Okay, so let's mimic the properties of subtractive color. Okay, well, if I take my three secondary colors, let's take cyan, and on another layer, we'll take magenta, and on another layer, we'll take yellow. Oops, let's take another layer here. And we set the blending option to multiply. Multiply is the same as working with a transparent sheet of plastic that allows light to pass through it. Okay. If I mix cyan and magenta, it gives me blue. Cyan and yellow gives me green. And magenta and yellow gives me red. Okay. We're reverting back to our primaries of light. Furthermore, if I mix all three together, it gives me black, whereas these three gave me white. These have additive, these have subtractive qualities. It's almost as if I've cut a hole in this white surface, haven't I, with black, by subtracting the light information. Moving on, so we've got to do this quickly, unfortunately, we have something known as simultaneous contrast. And simultaneous contrast is actually an optical effect caused by color and light. Okay, If we look at these two green squares over here, but instead of focusing on the green squares, you're going to stare at the line that goes right down the middle and allow these two squares to fall into your peripheral vision. Allow your eyes to blur slightly, but you're, really, you're focusing on this line right here. You'll immediately start to notice that this feels a little bit more of a bluish purple, and this feels a little bit more orangey. Okay, When in fact, if we look at these in context, if I actually connect, the, connect these two, we'll notice that they're identical. It's the same green. What's happening here is your brain has, when you, when you look at a color, your brain, especially a bright color for an extended period of time, your brain will readapt, readjust itself to its complementary color neurologically. So if we juxtapose, juxtapose meaning putting two things side by side, it's just a fancy, it's just a fancy term. If I juxtapose this green, against a bright yellow surface, my, because it's surrounded by this yellow, my eyes are readjusting themselves to this bright yellow surface towards its complementary color, violet, which will, make, which will cause this square to appear more, more purpley blue than it truly is. And contrarywise, because this is surrounded by blue, my, my eyes will readjust themselves to the complementary orange. And that's known as simultaneous contrast. Now, this is a very important thing for artists to know, especially when it comes to what color to paint your studio. My studio is deliberately painted a medium gray. Why? Because if I have a yellow room, when I'm trying to do color corrections, that yellow room, that wall behind my computer, will influence the way I perceive colors in a negative way. And then one day I'll look at it in a white, I'll, I'll look at my work on a screen in another room, in a white room, and I'll go, whoa, I completely screwed up those colors. That's why. Okay? Now, in the same way, 
that your brain readjusts itself to color. It also readjusts itself to value. And if we look at these two squares here, but we do so the same way we did with the, with the colors, we're just going to focus on this line in the middle and allow these two squares to fall into our peripheral vision. This one will appear lighter on the left, and this one will appear darker on the right. The same way our eyes readjust themselves to, to opposite colors or complementary colors, our eyes also readjust themselves to opposite values. So because this square is juxtaposed against a darker surface, it appears to be lighter because our, our brain is readjusting to a higher value. And contrary-wise, because this is against a whiter surface, a brighter surface, our brain is readjusting to a darker value. When in fact, just like we did with the other one, if I connect these two, it's the same value. Oops, like that. See? It's the same value. And that's known as chiaroscuro, or light dark, which is an old classic painter term used uh, from Italy. It's an Italian term meaning light dark. It's the phenomenon of light dark. By juxtaposing something darker next to something, it makes it appear lighter, and vice versa. Something lighter makes the other thing look darker. Now that we're on the subject of light and dark, it's a good point. It's a good time to talk about exposure. Exposure the same way a camera would deal with exposure. Well, how does a camera work? Let's give you a little layman's uh, a layman's explanation of what how a camera works. Well, you have the sun or a light source. The light source shoots photons of light in every direction, and those light photons bounce off of that surface and travel towards the lens of the camera or the aperture, the opening of the camera. And when it bounces and carries that information into the aperture, it's carrying the color and value information along with it. And depending on how open this aperture is, it's going to allow that light information to travel into the camera and expose itself against the film on the inside that has a chemical on it known as crystal halide. At least this is how older cameras work, not digital cameras. The crystal halide is a light-sensitive chemical that absorbs light and color information. It's very sensitive to it, hence the term exposure. Okay, and that's how your image is captured on film, in layman's terms. Now our eye functions exactly the same way, or very similarly. However, do take into account the fact that a human eye is far more powerful than a camera. The light bounces off a surface, it travels away from a light source, it bounces off the surface and enters the retina of our eye. And when it enters the retina of our eye, it travels down our optic nerve into our brain, and our brain decodes that into an image. Okay, so essentially what we're seeing is light, and light information. Now, exposure comes in, the term exposure also refers to how much or how little light exposure is happening at a certain point in time. Well, if, you, if you're in a low light situation, let's say I'm, I'm focusing my camera at a shadow, at a dark area, and I, and I expose my camera, I, I set my camera to, to read that dark information as, as well as possible. My lens, as a result, because it's focused on something that's dark, or in, I'm in a dark room with very low light, with very little light, my, the aperture of my camera will open up a lot in order to allow as much light in as possible. Because if it doesn't, not enough light will travel through the camera and expose on the film, and the, the, the image will appear to be too dark. Contrary-wise, if I'm in a very bright lighting situation, that aperture has to close to allow less light to pass through, because if it doesn't, and too much light comes in, too much light will expose itself against the film and it'll become too bright or even white. Now our eyes work exactly the same way. If you're in your studio for three hours working in the dark and then you go outside in the bright sunlight, it'll be extremely bright for about 10-20 seconds because our retina has actually grown much wider in order to allow more light to travel into our, into our brain. And contrary-wise, if we're in a very bright light lighting situation, then our retina will will get smaller and allow less light to come in so that we're not blinded by the light outside. And if you're ever curious, the reason why photographers very often will shine bright lights in the faces of models when they're taking portrait shots is because it causes the retina to close, exposing more of the color of the eye, making the eyes appear to be more colorful and beautiful. A little trick of photographers. Now that being said, I went, went outside and I snapped these two pictures with my iPhone. Now the reason I use my iPhone is because the iPhone can change exposure depending on where on the where you tap on the screen. So I don't have to move my camera. I can I can keep my phone pointed in the same direction, just tap in one spot, take a picture, tap in another spot, take another picture and I've changed the exposure. And in this case, I tapped on the sky, the brightest area of my image. 
where the sunlight is. And when I did, the aperture of my camera closed to allow less light in so that it would properly expose the sky and I would be able to capture the blue color. However, what happened as a result was any area in the shadow became too dark. The sky is, in, is properly exposed, but the shadows are underexposed. And in the same context, in this case, I tapped on the shadow, so the shadows aren't overexposed. The shadows are in proper exposure. However, all the lit areas in the sky were overexposed and bleached a little bit too white. And that's over and under exposure. Now, our eyes work the same way. And when you're taking that into account when you're painting, you're tapping into, a, into information and techniques and observations that you might, not have, you might have overlooked in the past. Now, this photograph I actually took last week at a summer fair. And the only thing I want to point out is the fact that I added this little blue circle in the middle of the sun manually in Photoshop, when in fact the, photo, the, the, the camera did not pick that up. My eyes did, and that's one of the differences you'll find between a camera and, your, and the human eye. However, this photograph, luckily, explores and shows examples of everything I just mentioned to you. Well, I exposed my camera to the sun. I clicked directly, I touched my camera directly on the, where the sun was to expose it to the sun so that it wouldn't, my, so that my sky wouldn't be overexposed. And what the camera did capture was the bright white in the middle. And you notice it falls, we start to get a fall off of different colors, the yellow, and then the lens flare catches the red and so on. Okay. Now, when we look at the white, we should, at this point, now that we have a, an understanding of light, understand that what we're actually perceiving is the mix of all the colors of light combined together to create this white. However, we know from, from photographs, from professional um, space photographs, that the surface of the sun is actually a mix of, of yellows, reds, blues, all these different colors, because it's a ball of gas that's swirling together. However, the intense light photons shooting off of this is giving off the impression of it being white because those photons are mixing together before they reach our eye. However, science has a way of, of decoding the truth of what the surface of this color actually is. Because when I stared at the sun for three seconds, not much longer than that because I didn't want to go blind, I immediately started to see the cyan blue circle appear and it was swirling around like this. Now the reason my eyes are seeing this is because of the phenomenon of simultaneous contrast. Because the sun is a bright orangey yellow surface, my eyes readapted to its complementary color, to this cyan color. And you'll notice this if you ever look at the sun as well. It's also cluing us in to the actual size and shape of the sun as well, because the fall off is giving off the illusion that it's actually bigger than it is. So we have our white light and we're watching how it splits apart. But what's important is I added this in myself manually, because if we look at this photograph with this blue circle, it actually helps enhance the illusion of an extremely bright light, because we have this effect of simultaneous contrast, the way our eyes and mind perceive a bright surface. We can also see in this photograph that we have a bit of overexposure here, or that could actually be fall off, but it could be considered overexposure, right? Because it's a little bit too white. The camera over, couldn't help but to overexpose itself because it was staring at such a bright surface. We can also see, like I said, the fall off of color as that white light breaks apart into its separate properties. We can also see how the, because I was exposed to the sky, how the tree, the areas here were underexposed. And furthermore, if we compare these clouds up here to these clouds down here, we'll notice that the contrast between the light and dark area is less drastic, it's less dramatic. And this here, if we look at this area of the clouds, it's actually, there's a sharper contract, the co contrast, there's more of a light and dark effect going on. And the reason for this being is chiaroscuro, light dark. Because these clouds are directly next to a, an extremely bright light source, it gives off the impression that they're darker visually than these. And the reason why is because our brain is creating the effect of chiaroscuro. Because these clouds are next to a bright sun, they appear darker. And because these are further away from the bright light source, they appear to be lighter, less contrasty. So that being said, all of these observations are going to be applied to my painting. And most of these adjustments that I'm going to be applying are through adjustment layers. And mostly, most in most cases, they're going to be brightness contrast adjustment layers that I'm going to apply to different parts of my painting, be it the tree, the sky, so on and so forth. So let's see how it unfolds.
Now you'll notice certain things unfold at this part that you might not be able to follow because I'm going to be playing and experimenting a lot, but I'm going to take a, a moment after to explain all of that to you so you won't be lost. I do want to, however, take a moment to talk about something very important and personal as well, and this is something that reflects on every different facet of your career and your life in general. It has to do with your ambition, your drive to keep pushing and being intense. I know Bobby Chu uh, uh, um, uses the term be intense or drawing with intensity, right? This taps into that as well. It has to do with finding your own personal expression and style. It has to do with all of these things. It has to do with your success and your recognition. And to give you an example, to help illustrate and set the stage for what for for understanding what I'm about to tell you properly. Look around at famous people. Look at celebrities, actors, singers, artists, whatever the case might be. Are they all perfect looking? Are, do they all have perfect voices? Do they all have perfect personalities? Absolutely not. It's a smorgasbord of different types of people, right? However, they all do possess one fundamental quality that, hold, that makes them stand out in the industry. And what that quality is, is their knowledge of self. How much they know themselves and how much they embrace who they are as individuals. A perfect example of this is in the making of the movie The Incredibles by Pixar, uh, where Brad Bird is describing the first time he met Bette Midler, the actress, or the actor. Okay, And he says, she was a little short woman, but she could walk into a room with 200 people in it and dominate that environment. She could completely steal the show. Now, why was that? Is it because she's better looking? Is it because she's taller? Is it because she's thinner? Is it because she's more charming? No, it's because she completely embraced and loved who she was as a person. Okay, She completely came to terms with who she was. She was a short, big-mouthed, red-head Jewish woman who was completely not afraid to show it off to the rest of the world. And as such, she wasn't looking for people, she wasn't trying to fit in to their crowd. She was being herself and allowing the people that liked that type of personality to be drawn to her. And her life, her career, her art is a reflection of her acceptance of herself and her own personality. And the same thing can be said for any actor, whether they be good looking or not. Brad Pitt, is, Brad Pitt Johnny Depp are perfectly good examples of that, two very good looking guys. But they're not trying to be something they're not. They're being themselves. And when they act, it's a projection of their internal self. And that's what makes them a success. That's what makes people like them. If Brad Pitt was trying to be somebody he wasn't, it wouldn't work. You wouldn't like him, right? He wouldn't find the success he does. Now, if we put that in the context of art, when it comes to your own personal growth, stimulation, success, recognition, style, the first thing you need to connect with is yourself. You need to start to get to know yourself. And I'm not talking about who you have become as a result of influence over the last 10, 20 years. I'm talking about who you were when you were five years old, that you remain today, despite all of the good or the bad that has come of it. You have a core personality that has been your personality since a very young age. And this is something I can confirm being a father of two children. I can see how they were who they were at three years old, and they remain that today. That hasn't changed. And I know that my daughters, when they're 30 and 40 years old, will still hold on to those core traits of their personality. That will always be there. Now, of course, there is the odd exception. If your core personality brings harm physically or emotionally to other people, then that's something you don't necessarily want to embrace. That's something you want to work out and get past. But in 99% of the case, that's not the situation. It's just a question of being unique. Maybe you're a jock. Maybe you're shy. Maybe you're a goof. Maybe you're a class clown. Okay. Maybe you're a big mouth. These are things you might have struggled with. But these are things that remain yours, despite all of the good and bad. And those are things you have to come to terms with. And allow other people to embrace that part of yourself, instead of you trying to doppelganger yourself to fit into every other crowd. And your art should be a reflection of that as well. Now. To clarify something, when you go to a studio and you're standing in front of a director applying for a job that you're looking for, if the director says to you, do you like fantasy art, and you respond, no, it's not my style, well, you're not going to get the job, right? So it's important that you do achieve a certain amount of versatility artistically. And the way to achieve that versatility 
is truly to just master the art, master the medium that you're working with. Through your own exploration, you will find the drive to work all the time. You'll never lose the drive because it's an exploration of yourself. Those curiosities, those things that you explore, those things that you're fascinated with, are things that tap into you. And through that, you'll develop the skills. And through those skills, you'll be able to translate those skills into anything you want. But you have to look internally first. And things like style, recognition, uh, beauty, skill, will all be perks of that exploration. But remember, know yourself first and work outward from there. Now at this point you'll notice that I created certain light effects but you might have had a hard time following what I was doing in order to achieve them. Now this is, most of these lighting effects are a combination of two things. Observation, just by looking up online reference or the observations I've made in, in just in analyzing nature or my the way I perceive light for instance. Common knowledge, the knowledge that I've attained through studying different things like lens flares and, and the way light breaks apart. Those all play a very important role in that as well because that gives me the power to be able to observe these things. And ex a bit of experimentation as well. I played a, a little bit with blending options and I'm going to take you through that. Um, to say that this is the formula for this particular thing would be misleading you. I wasn't that specific with my thought process. I was experimenting to see what surprises Photoshop could, could present me with just by experimenting with different blending options. But I'll take you through it step by step. Okay. If we just go from top to bottom, layer-wise, I'm not going to necessarily show you in order that I did it. Okay. The first thing you'll notice is this lens flare here on the bottom left in front of the tree. First thing I did was look up lens flares, but more specifically, lens flare sunset. I googled that because remember, a lens flare will have a different way to a lens will have a different way of responding to different lighting conditions. So I wanted to make it as specific as possible. And the way I recreated this was to go into my marquee tool my marquee selection tool by hitting M, M as in Michael, and I made sure that I was selecting elliptical marquee because I could also do square, okay, and I created a circle. However, I just didn't click and drag to create my marquee selection. I held down shift beforehand so I could create a perfect circle. And if you just hold down shift, you're going to make a create, you're going to cre um, make a perfect circle, but from that corner down. If I wanted to do a perfect circle from the middle out, I just hold, hold down shift and alt at the same time, Oops, work with me here. There, Shift and Alt <clears throat> will create a circle from the middle outwards. Okay, and from there I just went into my brush tool. I made sure that my other dynamics was turned on, shape dynamics turned off, and I just painted in along the rim with a nice big brush. When I deselect, you'll see that it gives me that nice circular rim like, a, like the lens flare would. And from there, if you look down at my lens flare layers, I set them to screen. Okay. Screen, I find, is a nice way of mimicking light, but it's a subtle approach to it. And it also has a nice way of responding to different values and colors underneath the way light would. But I, you could, uh, that could possibly be pulled off with overlay, and that could possibly be pulled off with, um, with dodge as well. You can play around. Like I said, you can play around with these blending options. And one of the ways that I sometimes experiment is, if you see my blending options window here, one of the quick ways you can do it is to click on your blending options and then click a second time. That'll make it selected and from there you can use your mouse wheel to roll down and experiment with different blending options. You can just flip through your blending options like that very quickly. Okay, It's a quick trick. And I just fell on the one that really felt best. I did that by eye. Okay, And I just superimposed two. One that had a bit more of a green and one that was a little bit more of a pink color. Now moving down I have light beams that shoot out from the sun. Okay, now how did I do that? Well, I created a new layer, and in my brush tool, I made sure that my other and shape dynamics were both turned off, but I had my brush hardness set all the way down. I wanted a soft edge brush. And to create a straight line, there's two ways of doing it. If you want to create a horizontal or a vertical straight line, you just hold down shift and drag your, your, your cursor across, or upwards. But that's only to do vertical or horizontal. If I want to do a diagonal one, I have to click in a spot, then hold down shift and click in a second spot. And that's a way of connecting the dots between two points. And I can continue to do that if I want, as much as I want. Okay. So I started off just by click and then shift click. Click, shift click. I have to let go of click when I 
when I start another line because otherwise it's just going to connect this line to the next line, right? I don't want to do that. So click, shift, click, click, shift, click. Okay. And once that was done, I created a new layer and parented it with by holding down Alt and clicking between these two layers. So that way I could paint over these active pixels without going outside. And I just physically came in with a brush, soft brush, and I painted in these different colors by hand. Okay, so let's say I picked these colors like this. I did it, I eyeballed it, I, just, just to see which way would work best. <clears throat> and once I was happy with the colors I picked, I just did Control E as an Eric to merge down. Okay, and if you look at the light beams, I actually set it to vivid light. And I very often use vivid light to simulate light beams because I have, I notice it, it has a way of um, simulating that bright, intense light, the way light breaks apart, like we've observed. Okay. But then again, I could have done this with other blending options. Vivid Light was the one that I found worked best, so I stuck with that. It's that simple. Now, the only other thing I did to my light beams to make it believable was to go into my eraser. I made it a nice big eraser like this, a soft edge, and I erased around the edge like that to have it fall off gradually, okay? So that it didn't just stop like a hard edge because light doesn't do that. Like that just doesn't stop. It has to fade off. And I might have done a little bit for the, the inside as well. So that gave me that nice light beam effect. Now if we move further down, here we're actually here I actually got a little bit more experimental. I'm gonna hide all of these layers and I'm just gonna start you off with this blending option with this uh, with this uh, adjustment layer. And the way I did that was to create an adjustment layer. Oops, not mask, but adjustment layer. Hello? Ah, yes, adjustment layer. And I, the, for this particular case, I set it to brightness contrast. And I immediately adjusted my brightness and my contrast to my liking. And once I was happy with that, I accepted it. Now I want to manually paint in this brightness contrast. I just I don't want to have it over the entire screen. So what I do is I click on my mask, because remember, when you do an adjustment layer, it automatically creates a mask. And when I'm on my mask, I do control I to inverse the colors. It goes the opposite direction. So lights turn dark and darks turn light. And from there, I can go into my brush tool while on my mask, and I set, make sure I'm on the white color. And here I can manually paint in the areas I wanted to have that light adjustment. That simple. Now if we work our way up, like I said, I was very experimental with it. But essentially what I wanted to achieve was I wanted the light to be brightest in the middle, and I wanted to get darker towards the outside, because I wanted our eyes to be pulled towards the lighter area towards our focal point. So I wanted to add some color variation and some darkness to the upper screen so that that would pull our eye towards towards the middle. Without that, our eye kind of wanders everywhere around the screen. And I didn't want that to happen, okay? So the first layer was set to color burn. That was purely done experimentally, flipping through blending options just to find the one that seemed to work for me. And I painted with a soft brush around these outer edges. And I further enhanced that with an overlay layer to add a little bit of color as well. It's very, very subtle, but I just wanted to start adding in some a little bit of color and maybe start touching on value a little bit. I'm going to really bring in the value later on, okay? Then I added two layers because uh, two layers set to hue <clears throat> because I didn't want to play with value. I just wanted to affect the color. Okay, and both the hue and the color blending options will only, when you paint using the hue or, or color blending option, the color ones here, okay, it will only affect color information but not value information. I don't want to darken or lighten this area. I want this gradient of light to dark to be controlled. So by setting it to hue, I'm only bringing in a subtle lighting effect or color effect without affecting the value. I'm not darkening it. I'm not giving this kind of rainbow frisbee effect to it. I just want to have a nice, gentle, very subtle effect of light falling off. Okay, And I had my red that goes directly around the sun, as I observed, and I added some green later on. From observing sun's sun rays, you don't necessarily see an entire rainbow of color traveling red, blue, green, purple, orange, so on and so forth. Generally what you'll see is you'll have your light source and then it goes to a bit of a red and if you look closely, depending on the lighting condition, you might see a little touch of green before it fades off into blue. That's generally what I've observed. And if you were to keep following the sky, it would eventually start to turn purple or indigo. Okay, But we didn't see that. Our sky doesn't travel off that far in, in this image. 
Now this one was a very, 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 very subtle effect. You're hardly going to notice it. But I just added a few little light rays peeking out from behind this tree. I just felt it needed it. I needed some kind of excuse to have light hitting off of these branches here on the side. Okay, so I just added a few of these little light rays and I set this to normal. That's all it was. Okay, very gentle. On this layer, again set to normal, you're hardly going to see it. The only way you can see it is by doing this. If you're not sure what you did on the layer, but you don't want to delete it by accident when it's something that you actually needed, you just have to do control and click on that window to select the pixels that were active. Oh, okay, I can see that I, I added extra white here to boost the, the value of the sun. Ah, okay, that's what I did, right? But you wouldn't necessarily be able to see it just by, by turning your layer on and off because it's such a subtle effect, you can hardly see it. Now, remember what I said about simultaneous contrast? If we look at this image from a distance, this might feel like, you know, a brightly lit area. But if you really want to give off that effect of a very intensely bright light, you have to start playing with some of the optical effects caused by light, like simultaneous contrast. And what I did was, with a normal layer, I painted in that cyan green color that I saw by staring at the sun, that optical effect that was caused. And if you look at it without, and then you look at it with, you can see that when I add that little cyan circle here representing the sun, it really gives off that illusion of intensely bright light. It's, an, it's a good trick to know. And finally, on a last layer, set to overlay, I added in a layer that both brought the value down slightly. Remember, I want to do this subtly. I don't want to just put black over the back. But I wanted to incorporate some green into this area. Why? Because I had painted in, I, I decided to add a little bit of a green under the water and that little third color really was I felt was that last splash of color that really made everything come alive however without this green on the top I felt that it was too bottom heavy because I had that green at the bottom and I needed to balance it up on the top to tie everything in together so by adding in that little touch of green overlay to the top I was really tying this entire image together. And furthermore, you'll notice even after I wrote my signature, I added in these extra light rays to add in even a little bit more green. Okay. Now let's go down and you'll notice how did I get this green? Well, I did that with the gradient tool. Okay. So I'm going to create a layer. I'm going to show you how I did this with the gradient. G opens up your gradient tool. You can see the gradient up here. If I click and drag, if I'm just on the regular gradient tool and I click and drag, okay, it's going to create a fall off from, from opaque to transparent. However, if I go into my gradient tool, okay, by default, it's actually going to be set to this. So the first default gradient tool. So essentially what that would cause is create is this. Okay, it would go from your foreground color to your background color. If I actually change my background color to red, you'll see that now my gradient goes from green to red. But I didn't want that to happen. I wanted it to go from a color to transparency. So you have to go into your gradient tool by clicking on the gradient up on the top left, and you have to check, click the second window here. And what that'll do is go from gradient to transparency, okay, or gradient to alpha, right? So that way, when I actually did my gradient, I just... Oh, and if you want to do a straight gradient, you hold down shift, the same way you would to do a straight line with a pen tool. Okay. I hold down shift and I just dragged up to about here and that was it. And this layer was just set underneath my water reflection so that it would catch under the water. And that was again from observation. I've observed that from looking underwater. You can very often see this gradient underneath this, this deep green. And the last but not least thing is just a little tip I wanted to give you. Sometimes when you're working on something like for instance when I did this rim light You'll have, the only way you can achieve this rim light is through that mask. If I delete my mask right now, then I'm going to lose it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to show everywhere I painted. I don't want that. But I don't necessarily want to keep that mask there. If you want to get rid of a mask, a good quick trick for that is to create a new layer on top and then merge down. And when, they, when it asks you to apply, preserve, or cancel, applying it means you are confirming that the pixels that we see are the ones you want to keep. By preserving, you're saying, I want to preserve that mask. If I hit preserve, then the mask is still there. That's not what I want. I want to just apply it. That way, it's going to keep 
the mask, whatever area was masked out is now deleted, and now I've flattened my lighting onto its own layer. I don't have to worry about that mask anymore. So that's it. That's how we did it. Now that we've reached the end of this piece, I would like to thank you very sincerely for sharing this experience with me. I'd also like to take this moment to thank you for all of your contributions, because without your feedback, this tutorial, of course, would not have existed. That being said, should you have any needs or curiosities that you're itching to explore, please feel free to get in touch with me or share your feedback and suggestions. This in turn, of course, helps me produce tutorials that cater to your specific needs, making the entire experience more enjoyable for everybody. I also encourage you, if you haven't already, to explore the hundreds of awesome tutorials online that have been produced by very talented artists worldwide. Take advantage of the gift of the World Wide Web. Remember that if you're feeling a little stale and you're having a hard time keeping yourself inspired and moving forward with your work, chances are it's because you aren't learning anything new. You need to learn to satisfy the artist in you. You need to learn something new as often as your brain can handle it. That being said, thank you once again, and take care.